mole gets converted into kilograms per mole. Now we did this the other day, so it's not new to us. It's just a recap of what we talked about. All right, so now a couple graphs here, just so you can get an idea. So we talked about molar mass, how it affects it. And we also talked about temperature and its effect on the root mean square velocity. So when you deal with molar mass, so the heavier molecules will have a much uh, denser distribution and, and then the lighter molecules are going to have a much broader. So this would be an example like 16 grams per mole versus 32 grams per mole. So if we were comparing oxygen gas versus methane, this is the way we'd see it. Now the top of the peak here coming down, this top of the peak is sort of the average. And so this represents the root mean square velocity of oxygen. And then this rep represent the root mean square velocity for methane. Now you can calculate that. All right, you just have to remember that you are needing to know the molar mass of these. So just a quick little rendition of this. So this eight three times eight point three one four. Uh, and then the units are joules per mole per Kelvin times. Now this is going to be at 298 Kelvin. So that's the difference here is that the temperature stays constant. So 298 Kelvin and then divide it by. Now the molar mass of oxygen is 32 grams per mole. So that in kilograms is 0 0.032 kilograms per mole. All right, so. Let's plug that in our calculators and see what we get there. All right, so I get 481. 0.9 meters per second for oxygen. So let's do the same thing for methane here. All right, so for methane, the only difference here is it's going to be point is that 0 0.016 kilograms per mole. The top stays the same, so I'm just going to use some quantities there to make sure and remember that. So in the calculator, let's plug this in and we should see a change here. In fact, see a little change. So this one's 681.6 meters per second. So what we can see here is that at the same temperature, the root mean square velocity for methane is going to be well, it's going to be higher than that of oxygen gas. And that's because the molar mass is definitely lighter. It's half the and what we see with oxygen. So, so that's why the distributions are the way they are. Excuse me. Now, as we look at the temperature, so when we look at temperature, we don't focus on molar mass. We just look at an individual molecule. So, so let's say we have uh, methane, for example. So what we see here at 298 Kelvin, so now we're going to have a little different curve here. So they have 298 Kelvin. All right. Uh, this would be the distribution diagram for methane. Now, let's say we bump it up to 500 Kelvin. All right. So we, we have a different temperature. So we're going to utilize the same equation, just change the temperature now. So instead of it being 298, we're going to put 500 into that. And that's going to be, all right, so at 500 Kelvin, the velocity is going to be 882 meters per second. So we would expect our diagram to be something like this. You can see that the curve is a little bit more broad for the higher temperature. And so we have that higher velocity here. So the distribution diagram, it, it's it's similar, but you, you have to make sure you understand whether you're working with molar mass or you're working with the temperature aspect. So, so as the temperature increases, 
the root mean square velocity increases increases and the there is a larger distribution So that's basically what we're getting from this. All right, so that that takes care of, you know, the root mean square velocity topic. And so really what that does is it, it gets us into the next law, which is dealing with Graham's law. All right, so Graham's law, and I'm going to go back to the, the little guide handout in just a second. So Graham's law is really referring to you know the, the the passing of a gas through a tiny orifice. So uh, let me go back there right now so we can look at this. All right. So looking at the definition of Graham's law. So Graham's law found experimentally that the rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of its particles. All right, so effusion is the word we're looking at here, and that's the important part. All right, and effusion is the passing of a gas through a tiny orifice into an evacuated chamber. And the rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root. All right, so those are important here, right? Um, so, All right, now what that means is that the rate of the gas is equal, well, I wouldn't say equal, is proportional to one over the square root of the molar mass of that gas. I'm going to say rate one and molar mass one, so that way we know we're dealing with the same gas. Now, as we look at the effusion part in going through a tiny orifice, so what is an orifice? So let's say we have a... We have two vessels connected together, and in the middle, you have this orifice. Now, this is just a little bit blown up section of it, but in that orifice, you have this very tiny hole. Now, on this side, you have an evacuated chamber, so there's no gas that's present. On the right-hand side, you're going to have let's say one atmosphere of, of, of gases. And the gases can be composed of, let's say hydrogen gas and methane, all right? So now the hydrogen gas has a molar mass of 2.016 grams per mole, and then methane is 16 grams per mole. So what we, what we look at here, when we compare the rates here, so the, when we look at the rate of hydrogen, all right, so it's equal to one over the square root of the molar mass. Now hydrogen's molar mass is 2.016. So what we get from this is just simply calculating this, we can see what's gonna happen here. So I'm just dividing one divided by the square root of 2.01. So the, the rate is gonna be equal to point seven zero for hydrogen. I'm going to do the same thing for methane here. And so one divided by the square root of 16. All right, so one divided by 16 gives me 0 0.25. And so what I see here is the rate of hydrogen is larger than the rate of CH4. And so as a result of that, the hydrogen gas is going to pass through this tiny orifice about probably what is that about is that 0.7 that's about three times faster so we're good so hydrogen gas is going to pass through three times faster than methane all right so in fact it'll pass through this tiny orifice until eventually what will happen is the vessels will be even at pressure you'll have a half atmosphere on both sides of of that vessel but we're not 
interested in how long it's going to take. We're just interested in Graham's law and what Graham's law states. And again, Graham's law states that the that the rate of effusion is inversely proportional to the square root. Now, again, uh, effusion is the passive gas to tiny orifice. So when we compare two different, and that's what I was actually doing there, I was comparing the rate of of hydrogen compared to the rate of of the CH4. And so I said it was 2.8. How I determined that, just so you guys know this, is that I put the rate of hydrogen over the rate of CH4. I, I calculated the rate to be 0.7 for hydrogen and the rate to be 0.25 for methane, and that gave me 2.8. That means that that hydrogen gas will effuse 2.8 times faster than CH4. That's what that means. And so, uh, so when we look at this and we figure out that rate, that that rate, that ratio there really is determining how much faster one's going to rate uh, if used compared to the other. Does everyone understand that? Yes. All right. Remember that you can t you can chat on here. I, I can see what you're chatting here. All right. So I need feedback at least so that way I know that you all are on the same page as me. Thank you for responding. Thanks, Sydney, for responding. But does everyone else understand that? All right. Yeah, we'll look at so we'll look at the one in the handout. So that's the other one we can look at here. So again, this is the equation that you use to compare two different gas molecules together. And so calculate the ratio of effusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride. And that, that's a gas used in the enrichment process. That's not important right now and what is important is that you know what the formula for uranium hexafluoride is and that would be uf6 and so what we need to do is figure out the molar mass of these two gases so so we figure out the molar mass hydrogen gas is 2.016 we did this one a minute ago and then uf6 is 352.06 so just looking at the molar mass of the periodic table you can figure that out now we're going to use this equation up here to solve for this. We did that here, but we did it nonchalantly. We just calculated the rates for the together to form a ratio. So that's all this equation is doing here. It's just forming a ratio. It's a little bit more defined though. So you might ask the question, so which gas do I want to put on top for gas one? And which gas do I want to put on the bottom for gas two? I normally will put the lighter molecule on top because I don't like dealing with fractions too much. I, not that they're challenging or anything, but it's a little easier to see a whole number, something that's a little bit more understandable. So I use hydrogen. I'm going to put hydrogen on top. And I'm going to put the UF6 on the bottom. Now, what we're trying to do is configure out the rate of the difference between the ratio. So remember they're inverses. So if you put UF6 on the bottom here, UF6 will go on top up here. So if you look down here, I placed the 352 on top and I put the 216 on the bottom. Remember they're inverses. So hydrogen's on top here. It's on the bottom here, and then opposite is found here. So uh, what we do is we take the calculator, we take the square root of 352 divided by the 2.016, and we end up with 13.2. Now, just like we saw a few minutes ago with the rate between methane and hydrogen, we found that hydrogen gas effuses 2.8 times faster than methane, 
Well, looking at UF6, it's a whole larger compound. So you expect hydrogen gas to fuse much faster because of that difference between the molar mass of hydrogen gas compared to the molar mass of UF6. In fact, from the calculation, we end up with 13.2. And what that means is that hydrogen gas will fuse 13.2 times faster than uranium hexafluoride. And that should make sense. Lighter molecules are going to move faster, and as a result, they're going to effuse much faster. The question is, how many times faster? In this case, hydrogen gas compared to UF6 is 13.2 times faster. Does that make a lot? Does that make more sense, Nicolette? Does any, anybody have any questions? All right, good deal, Nicolette. Okay. All right, so we have uh, one more thing to talk about here with Graham's Law, and that's diffusion. The definition of a diffusion is the mixing of gases. All right, and I'm going to pick on Devin here for a minute, okay? So let's say we have our classroom. All right, I'm up here in the front writing on the whiteboard. We're talking about chemistry. And we have the students back here at their desk. In this de room, we're going to have six people. Actually, we're going to put nine people. So Devin sits back here. And we have other students sitting around. Now, what problem is Devin is, is that he ate some food that didn't agree with his stomach. And, well, unfortunately, he passed a little gas. Now, the good thing is, is that I'm in the front of the room, so I'm never going to smell this gas. The unfortunate part is that the students that were sitting here, A, B, and C, the gas will actually travel out towards them. It diffuses outwards. But what's interesting is that it diffuses in all directions. And it's going to mix with all the other gases that's in the atmosphere. The students that are, that are sitting close to him are going to smell it more. But then as it goes further out into the room, it's going to be more diluted because it's going to have to mix with all the gases that's in the air. And so the people that are that are on the outside, they may not even know that it happened, and which is a great thing for them. Unfortunately, the people that A, B, and C, they probably aren't going to survive because it was a deadly toxic gas that came out. And I never will even know until I look back and I see students passing out because of the gas. So remember, diffusion is just the passing of gas throughout space. It's going to diffuse out until eventually it's spread to a point where you can't detect it anymore. Your nose can't detect it. It's there, but you can't detect it because its concentration is too diluted at that point in time. So it's just like we talked about the other day. Uh, you have a system. This gas molecule is going to travel throughout the system, and it's going to mix with all the other gases. And as it mixes with the other gases, it gets more diluted. It's like wearing cologne or perfume. Uh, if you've ever been near someone that has perfume or cologne, you can smell it pretty quickly. But if you're far away from them, you never even know it because it diffuses out. And over time, it does dilute in its concentration. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Devin. I, I don't mean to pick on you. I'm not going to pick on you anymore. So you're off the hook now. It's okay. Right. I forgive you. What did you say, Devin? I said it's okay. I forgive you. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping so. Thanks for doing that. All right. So let's talk about real gases. So this whole topic we've talked about so far has been around the ideal gas. And so ideal gases, be reminded, are gases that are they have no attractions or repulsions. Now we know that that's not necessarily true because if you wake up and go outside like this morning. 
last night you went to bed there was nothing on the surface of your car now in the morning you see there's dew built up on your car where'd that dew come from because it didn't rain last night it was clear all night last night that dew came from the fact that the moisture that was in the atmosphere condensed and formed a liquid on the surface and so that suggests that these gases may not be ideal gases where they have no attraction repulsion it's to the point where hey maybe they do have some attraction and repulsion maybe there's something going on there and so van der waals was the scientist that came up with this idea and he describes this ideal through his equation called van der waals equation and so there are deviations that occur from the ideal gas law that we observe. Now, the ideal gas law, remember it's PV divided by RT, so that represents the moles of gas, and you have a constant one where you see this dashed line that runs across here. This represents the ideal gas, and so anytime these, these gas molecules come in contact with that, that's where they're going to be representing an ideal gas. Any other time, they're considered to be a real gas. And so, as you can see, the molar mass of a gas changes. That also changes and creates a deviation from the curve and from this ideal gas line here. Now, hydrogen gas, if you notice, hydrogen gas touches the, 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 the ideal gas line right at the very beginning and lighter molecules tend to do that. But these heavier molecules takes a little bit more pressure in order for them to reach that aldo gas. Now, uh, uh, the van der Waals equation is defined here, all right? So if you are taking notes, I'm gonna give you guys just a couple minutes. I want you to write down this equation, okay? So you need to write this down and make sure that you write down van der Waals equation. All right, so looking at the equation there, P is equal to NRT divided by V. There's your ideal gas law. Now, the other parts here are representing, uh, so you have minus NB minus A times N over B squared. N over V is your molarity. So moles divided by volume here of the gas. Now, A and B are, are constants, and that's what I want to talk about right now, is that these A and B are, are your Van der Waals constants. A represents attraction, and B represents size. So you have to pay attention to, again, the molar mass of the gas and the size of the gas. Now, the nice thing about this is that you do need your textbook for this, and then you side your textbook in this chapter, there is a table that they give you that list these constants. All right, I'm not going to give you these constants because each gas has its own constant because each gas is a little different. So keep in mind this is in chapter six and it's going to be in section 16, which I think looks like it's on page 246 in your book. So if you do have your textbook, you know, you can look in there. So page 246. All right, so that's where it starts at. And let's see here, moving on here. Okay, so the, the table is 6.5. It's on page 248. It's on the left-hand side. So this is in the, the new, the fifth edition. All right, so again, it's on page 248, table 
It's called Van der Waals constant for common gases. And remember that the this is going to change in relation to what gas you're looking at. So that's why we can't say it's blah blah blah. It's going to change. It's going to be different for each individual gas. So. Any questions on that? So is there any questions on Van der Waals equation there? I mean, I, I know that y'all have to y'all have to just work with it and practice with it. But do follow the example here, OK? I do provide you a couple examples below here. I do give you the the Van der Waals constants for this gas in particular, so nitrogen gas. And. So calculate the pressure exerted by 0.5 moles of N2. Uh, you so one thing I will make a comment here. This is a, this is a calculation that you should not take lightly. What I would suggest you do when you get done with lecture is to sit down. Do this calculation. Don't assume you can do it. Do it and make sure that you end up getting the answer that you see here. Now what I've done here is I want to compare Van der Waals equation with the ideal gas law. And what you see here is the the pressure that you get for Van der Waals equation is slightly different from that of the ideal gas law because you have to focus on the gas that you're looking at. Van der, the ideal gas law does not focus on the individual gases where Van der Waals equation does. And that's because of the fact that gases do have interactions. Ideal gas law has no interactions, so it take it doesn't take that into consideration. All right. Uh, so another thing we can look at here. In fact, I'm going to pull up a. So uh, let's see here. Paint ball gun CO2 tank. All right, so I want to just. Uh, it wants me to go find something. We don't want to find it. I want a picture of it. All right, so I assume that everyone has seen a CO2 cartridge at some point in time, whether it being that they used it to shoot off a rocket or they've used it to propel paintballs or even oxygen tanks. So all these have pressurized gas inside of them. So this is the container here. Uh, one thing that you probably have noticed if you've ever handled one of these is that if you pick it up in your hands and you tilt it from one side to the next side, you actually can feel the weight of the gas transfer from one side to the other side as you shift it. And the reason for that being is, is that because it's under pressure and as it's increasing the pressure inside, you cause the gas molecules to attract to each other and they form a liquid. So inside of this container, the CO2 cartridge, it's actually a liquid CO2. Now, as soon as you pull the trigger, you release that pressure. Now that liquid turns into a gas immediately and that's what propels your paintball out. You know that if you've ever been hit with a paintball, it's not very fun, it hurts. Has any of you ever played with paintball guns before? Yeah, so is it fun being hit with a paintball? A lot of people wear face masks and protection so that way if they do get hit with a paintball, it don't hurt quite as bad. Uh, when I was younger, when paintballs just came in to play and it was a popular thing, we didn't have protection and face masks. We just shot each other and, and when it hit, it hurt. Hey, it hurt bad, but the funny thing was is that there were actually woods back then and we could hide from each other in the woods. I'd always find a log or something to climb up underneath and wait for people to come by and ambush them as they come through. <laughs> but you know, that's the thing of the past. But I definitely hated getting hit with a paintball. It wasn't fun. I always would leave a bruise. So. 
If you know, you know. If you don't know, well, go out there and try it one time and see what it's like. You might like it. So, all right. So we're at the end of that uh, that document. Now, at the also at the very end, I do provide some more examples with Dalton's Law, and that's the end of the document. Uh, I did pull up the gas stoichiometry worksheet because you know, I wanted to just kind of run through a couple examples, assuming that we'd have time, and it looks like we do have time here. So, so let's look at a couple examples here. All right, here it is. Is that the page I want to be on? No, let's go back here. All right, here it is. So this is the first problem. And what you can see, there's, there's actually two problems here, but we're going to look at problem one. So this carbon monoxide reacts with oxygen to produce CO2. So if one liter of carbon monoxide reacts with oxygen, STP, how many liters of oxygen are required to react? So that's letter A, part A. Now, before we do anything, what we need to do is, is write out the balanced equation. So carbon monoxide reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. So oxygen gas is O2 and carbon monoxide is CO. So CO reacts with O2 and it produces CO2. Now to balance this equation out, you're going to have two COs to one O2 to two CO2s. All right. The next thing, so so the first thing is you got to write out the balanced equation. In fact, look, looking at number two, you can see that number two, you have to go through the same process. So you have to write the equation out and balance it before you can do anything. And so the next thing I want you to understand is that it says if one liter of carbon monoxide reacts with oxygen at STP, so standard temperature and pressure. So at STP, you have one atmosphere, 273 Kelvin, you're given the molar volume. You can use the molar volume of 22.4 liters per mole. And that's important. Now you can use the outdoor gas law if you want, but that's not necessary in this problem here. All right. Now what I've done here is I said, okay, how many liters of oxygen are required to react? So I know that I've got to convert my liters of carbon monoxide because that's what they're giving to you here. I got to convert liters of, of carbon monoxide into moles of carbon monoxide and then convert moles of CO into moles of O2 using the mole ratio and then go back to liters. All right. So uh, so that's your roadmap there. So what I want to do now is do the calculation with you. I'm going to write it out here. And so let's do that. All right. So one liter and multiplied by, so we want to go to moles. We need to divide by the 22.4. So it's uh, one mole for every 22.4 liters. All right, so that cancels out the liters. I'm going to put these together in one unit so we can just do one calculation versus three or four. All right, so we're going to use the mole ratio here now. So we're trying to go from moles of CO and moles of O2. All right, so we look at this, it's a one to two ratio. So it's one mole of O2 for every two moles of CO2. And so this is going to be two moles of CO2 up here. All right, and so we need our CO2 to cancel out here, which that's what I, that's why I put that up there. And because we were working with CO2 to begin with, or CO, I don't know why I kept saying CO2. All right, CO there. So we end up with moles of O2. So let's do this calculation right now. All right, so we got to have one liter divided by 22.4 divided by two gives me 0 0.0223 moles of O2. Now, the problem asks for us to figure out how many liters of oxygen gas are required. So to do this, we need to use the mole 
the molar volume again, but this time instead of dividing by it, we're going to multiply by 22.4 liters per mole. All right, so your moles cancel out here. All right, say 0 0.0223 multiply by 22.4. That gives me a value of 0 0.49952 liters. Now we want this to be three sig figs here. So we can have, it's going to be 0 0.500 liters for your answer here. And that should make sense, all right, because thinking about it logically, you have one liter of CO, it's one to two ratio, so you're going to have, you need half the volume of oxygen compared to CO. So that's a half a liter versus one liter. So that should make sense, but but that's how you work the problem. Now, part B says how many liters of carbon dioxide produced from this volume, all right? So we're going to continue the same problem out. So we have, so look at this is part B here. So one liter times one mole of CO for 22.4 liters. We're going to use the mole ratio. Now the ratio is two moles of CO2 for two moles of CO. All right, so that goes away. The liters cancel out. So we're going to have one divided by 22.4 uh, times two over two. And that gives me 0 0.0446 moles of CO2. It says how many liters of CO2 are produced. So now we're going to multiply by 22.4 liters per mole again. So the moles cancel out. And so you end up with 0 0.9904 liters. Now this needs to be three sig figs, so let's convert this three sig figs, which is going to be 1.00 liters of CO2. So that will be your answer there. All right. Now the whole point of this is to make sure that you understand that you're working at STP, so you're utilizing this molar volume function. All right, so this is the important thing here. All right. And as we look back at our problems in this handout here, all right, always ask yourself the question, is this at STP? Does it say at STP? And if you look here, it's at STP, it's at STP, and if and most of these are going to be STP on this first page. Now, when it comes down here into problems 10 and on, it says that do not occur at STP. So you can't use molar volume here. You're going to have to use the ideal gas law or Boyle's law or whatever gas law that's going to be needed in order to calculate the answer. So when you get down in here, you can't just assume that you're going to use molar volume like we used in the previous problems that you see here. So make sure that this is something that you practice and and give yourself a little time to to digest and understand it. And just remember that the answers are on the last page here.